Hello and welcome to this presentation on airborne wind energy. Um, this is from Windswept and Interesting Limited and I'm Roderick Reed. Now, this presentation was originally given at the Airborne Wind Energy Conference in Strathclyde and unfortunately the videos that were recorded at that conference weren't deemed of high enough quality to reproduce. So it's lockdown 2020 just now and um, you can see I've got a terrible haircut. So I've got time now to go over this video again and um, go over this presentation and let you know about another type of airborne wind energy. So at the conference there was talk that there's a fair bit of convergence in the designs in airborne wind energy and I think possibly that's misrepresented in that mostly it's been yo-yo systems, pumping kite systems that I've talked about. Now this is a very different uh, strategy of working out airborne wind energy. Um, it involves networking multiple kite units together. So we'll go over that here. You can see various examples. I've got a, a soft one working, a broken one working, um, one out in public, another one in the background. And we're going to talk about the scalability of them as well. So let's have a little look. This is uh, what they look like when they're up and spinning. You can see the fairly rigid blades on a fairly soft shaft there. And this is just outside the house here, just uh, around the corner. And yeah, it's a very simple setup. So let's go over what that is. The main things to take away from this presentation are that these designs are homemade. They're very simple. The scalability of these designs seems to be very good so far. And they're really safe. Be mostly because of the simplicity and partly to do with the networking. So we'll go over each one of these uh, components. Simplicity, why is it simple? Well, there's no controller in the airborne part, so there's not much to go wrong. These are lifted into the air. You saw a lifting kite at the top. Uh, there's a, so you've got your rotor there, there's a lifting kite above that. There's, um, you know, in those they're inherently mechanically um, in place so you don't need all those very technical airborne controls that keep having to be improved in order to get anything reliable in the sky. Uh, this is you know, mechanically autonomous. They're very simple to build and put out there. Um, I you know, carry the kit out on my own, I can take it out in a car. One of my kids took a set off uh, to Austria and deployed it for a week there. They work in torque so there's continuous output. Again, that's simple because you don't need the power conditioning systems that you do for other setups, uh, certainly the pumping ones. They're also simple to keep stable because networks have a wide tethering topology and kites with wide tethering uh, are a lot more stable to fly. So if you've got you know, a great big wide bar, your kite in the middle can be held very securely and you know, easily hold a position. So you see that, like we say, simple. These are made on some very cheap toys, as you'll see there. The, the very first one being just an old mountain bike with a, a motor on it. So stability. Here you see kites with a wild wind vector going over the field. Each one of the blue lines, you know, is uh, hitting it. But now you've got a network tying those kites together, and the individual kites are held much more in position as compared to when the network isn't there. The networkings give you this wide uh, stability, which really helps in performance. Like I say, it's you know been super simple. There's been some very cheap and cheerful designs along the way. And even just a stick in the ground um, with a wheel on top is enough for a ground station in this case, because you're looking at a rotary uh, output power. So it's been really simple designs. Okay, so. Next thing we'll look at scalability. You can stack these designs. So you can put one rotor on top of another one, as you saw in the uh, video at the start. You can um, pack them over fields, so we can array them uh, under lifting uh, networks. And you can change the sizes as they are alive. So you'll notice some of them expand when they're working, and that's uh, important to another part of the scalability we'll look at as well. The, another thing you can do is layer them concentrically as well. So there's, there's quite a bit of layering in these network designs. And so with the basic rotor uh, 
stacked into a, a three layer turbine there, you can you know, multiply that, add it into one of these lifting networks and end up with a field here where the rotors are stacked, they're packed onto the field and you can even add them concentrically up the set there. The scalability is really good in terms of deployment and field deployment, but if you look at the scalability of an individual turbine, um, so this is looking from the base there, there's the top, we've got these four spectres of the kites which are very reasonable uh, in their direction, so we're looking from the side here, there's more lift on the top ones, slightly larger because they're going to be in a slightly um, higher wind, maybe faster, probably a bigger wing as well deployed, they'd be more efficient. But you look at the bottom ones, they're opened up slightly more. The top ones, more about driving uh, and lifting, whereas the bottom vectors, they're a wee bit more about expanding the set open, so keeping the, the network open as the whole thing turns around. Now, why, why is it that way? Well, if you imagine this is purely soft, this, uh, this inner network, the green materials, which uh, at the bottom you can see it goes to a much higher force with maybe yellow and red. If you have just a soft, uh, like a trouser leg maybe, or you know, some sort of sleeve like that, and you twist it, it's going to compress the torsion in the middle will make it collapse. But if you have on every point on that sleeve, uh, you have a piece lifting out, like a kite, pulling it outwards, then you can expand the size of this soft torque transfer mechanism onto something really, really large. And according to the studies we've done, this can be very large indeed. Um, with, well, we don't know the limit of number of kites operated on that. That really will probably come down to functionality and how deployment works. Um, we've got a few schemes in the plans for that. Uh, so you see, in action, it actually works like this. You see the, the sort of triangular shape the rings are taking, and those, those are rings on deployment. When it starts spinning up, and you know, once you, you've got the force in the in the kite blades, those blades are slightly banked down so that they're you know, tending to expand. But there's also uh, centrifugal acceleration there as well uh, as that's rotating around. So that keeps everything outwards. Now, the if I go back a wee second, you've got the two parts there. You've got the turbine on top, and so that's expanding. But let, let's look now at the transmission section. You'll see there's a section here of rings lower down. Now, in terms of scalability, this section doesn't have to be that long. Uh, it only has to be high enough so that you clear the ground. So as the rest of the thing scales up and stacks on top, that wouldn't have to change. Yes, you'll probably want to go wider as you make bigger systems. Uh, that really helps with the force transmission. Also, you don't want a large gap between the rings on the way up much easier to transfer torque between um, shorter gaps and that's what these studies here have been showing that we've got uh, for a certain ratio of ring size ring diameter to gap between the rings it's much better in t uh, for compression on the elements if you've got a large ring and you've got um, a short gap and it kind of makes sense really that you can transmit but there are you know, conditions where you will be able to make these things fail, you know, so under extreme loading that will happen. This is 168 kites on one soft shaft here, and there's a whole lot of very fast forwarded uh, beam compression simulations that we worked on in order to work out you know, as we scale up what are, the, what are the needs of these systems, and so we've been doing a bit of charting. And, we reckon we're getting somewhere on the, the scaling on that and it, it's yeah, looking good. So safety. Right, I'm going to show you what happens when these things break and th this is probably the most interesting part. Um, we've been doing FMEA and stuff since the conference and uh, working on improved models but here uh, back in October 2019 we um, we'd had a few tests before we went out and here's three situations where the system had issues, okay, so in this one, this was the, the first one that happened, seven lines here twisted together, the whole shaft over twisted because of poor control in the ground station, and those seven lines broke. That sounds catastrophic, apart from, you'll notice here, there's a back line 
and nothing actually broke away. So if you've got a pumping line system or um, any of your standard drag mode kite setups, a line break is catastrophic. Here, seven lines broke and nothing broke away. You know, everything stayed absolutely connected to ground. So that's you know a definite safety mechanism there. And again, you can see the back line coming into use on uh, this bottom right picture here. Um, there was an over twist due to the ground station being uh, insecure in, in how it was tracking. So normally I've got a couple of sticks bunged in the ground to help for that, but we're again working on a better system for that. Um, but you see the back line is very handy for bringing the rotor uh, to stall. You can bring the rotor out of plane of the wind and when it comes round it'll stall uh, as it's side on to the wind. It's also very good for launching and lifting and, and recovery options. In terms of a large network you can either deploy um, up the lifted lines, the type of lift networks we saw earlier, or you can you know have back lines, side lines, other lines, have the whole lift network come round out of the wind and drop things up and down that way. Here's the plan. The uh, third one here on your left, you'll notice there's three broken parts here. This uh, was spun up too, too hard and, and basically the, the design was too weak at the back of the fuselage. So you'll notice behind each of the, the fuselage join points here on the, the rings, there's been a snap in what the, these rods were, yet the whole thing is still going round. Now we've had lines snap uh, on various parts, you know, multiple lines snap and the whole thing still works before. So you'll notice degraded performance if a piece does break. And so at this point, we weren't taking full power out of here, but we still let this run. And you can see the, the wing loading on these wings here as it's still a wing and round. So there's various ways to um, take this forward and optimize all these systems and, and work and stuff. And so we're looking at whole ways to improve it, a whole bunch of ways. And yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of good stuff to be said about how this can be done, where it can be done, and uh, it's got a lot going for this system. So yeah, there's the main takeaway. Network kite systems are simple, scalable, and safe. Uh, networks really are, they, they really bring advantages into airborne wind energy. So yeah, that's the presentation for AWIC 2019 out of last. Okay, thank you very much.